I'm Francesca Donnellan. Welcome to Becoming More Human, the podcast. Every generation, through its arts and creativity, explores the same questions. Who am I and what really matters? We are so often taught how to emulate others, to make other people happy. But how do we access what's good for ourselves and be strong enough to actually claim it? It's a constant practice because we all keep evolving. There are no limits to personal growth. You can start your journey today and get closer to discovering your true self. Give back to the people around you and make the world a better place. Hello listeners, on today's episode I'm talking with Julia, a former teacher who's now a CEO. Julia started out in life as a teacher in London, but made a huge life decision to move to Bangkok eight years ago with the main goal of just wanting to see more of the world. Well, during that time, Julie became an accidental solo entrepreneur and built three businesses from the ground up. Now, Julia is a plant-based restaurateur, the founder and CEO of a vegan health food brand and a global business and life coach. From selling her vegan food at pop-ups and food markets, Julia's business expanded into the Banana Warrior Cafe, which has become one of the most successful vegan restaurants in Thailand. Julia recently started a business life coaching practice after realizing that assisting other entrepreneurs and startups elevate their lives and businesses all over the world is also a huge passion of hers. Julia plans to open her next plant-based fusion restaurant in London later this year. So enough from me and let's jump straight in. I've had stages throughout my life and throughout my business journey that have been quite monumental changes um, that have just changed who I am, but also kind of forced me into personal growth. You know, just absolute. There was no question about the the fact that I'd have to up level in order to kind of make room for these changes. I think one of the biggest ones was, so I was a primary school teacher in London um, wow. and I actually became a primary school teacher, I know, to um, to travel. And so I was about five years into teaching and one of my friends who I taught with in mm. London said to me, there's a job opening in the school that I'm in in Bangkok in Thailand, why don't yeah. you apply for it? And I just thought, yeah, go on then, I'll just apply and see what happens. And a week later, I was packing for Thailand and I'd never lived abroad before no idea what to expect really scared because it was so far out of my comfort zone but it was just at a point in my life where I thought you know what I'm so up for a change I don't know what that is but you know perhaps this is it and I need to go and do it and it was it was kind of that inner calling you know where you're like I have to do this because it's going to be a massively missed opportunity if I don't and I did it and I think the hardest part about it, I mean, that was probably one of the hardest parts of my entire life, honestly, because it took me a really long time to settle in Thailand. And I think the difficulty was, is that I desperately wanted it to work. I desperately yeah. wanted to be this international liver. Um, right. But I just, it was, I had no home comforts. I found yeah. it really hard to find any home comforts. It was all very foreign to me, you know. I yeah. couldn't even find ingredients that I like to cook with and I didn't find a yoga studio that I really liked or a hairdresser so all the things that I used to do that made me feel good and grounded in London took me a really long time to find in Bangkok and and also you know the the expats were all from different countries and so even just the the level of humor and what we would talk about and things like that were really different to what I was used to you know and I almost moved back six months after I moved to Thailand and it was really close. And I remember my mum saying to me, you know, Julia, if you're crying every day, maybe it's time to just leave it. Mm. And, um, but I remember thinking to myself, well, if I do move home though, what am I saying to myself? Am I, I think what I would be saying to myself is I can't live abroad. I couldn't make it work for myself. And I didn't want to take away that opportunity perhaps in the future, if anything came my mm. way, I didn't want to have that that closed feeling in my head that I couldn't exist abroad or I couldn't make it work for myself. And so I remember just making that decision, right, you've got to make this work. I don't know how you're going to do it, but you, you've just got to make it work and it's going to be different to London. And I just, and then I, I think I just made the decision to just change my mindset. And it's amazing, isn't it? When you make a decision about mm. something, the massive changes that happen. And I grew as a person because I had to, and I learned how to make something that naturally didn't work for me work. 
That's incredible. Um, and I think that was massive. Yeah, I think it was massive to me starting my own business then because I showed myself that I could do something really hard. And I it opened, I think when you do that, and you move so far out of your comfort zone, you you show you open a new world for yourself. Mm. There's a new world that opens inside your mind as well. And your entire life and what you believe is possible for yourself completely up levels and totally changes. And that is massive. That is, you know what, you just made all the hairs on my arms all stick up. I can feel it. <laughs> <laughs> that was... That was obviously something I needed to hear myself. I always find in these conversations that there's always a reason behind yeah. them. And it's it's quite incredible because your mindset during those sort of first six months, I would imagine you were kind of stuck in a fear state, a bit of yeah. the unknown. You knew what you were missing at home. And yeah. how did you, you know, you talk about it so easily, like I just, you know, sorted my mind out and got myself straight. <laughs> yeah. How did you actually, yeah. how did you actually tackle that? Is there anything that you, that you did or did you notice? Do you journal? How, how did you get out, out of that fear state and really pull your socks up really and, and focus what, on what you really wanted to do? Yeah, that's such a good question. You're right. And I, and now when I look back on it, I remember how hard it, how hard it was but there was something about that decision that had nothing to do with anybody else. You know, so many people can kind of try and influence and give advice. But I remember just thinking, no, this is my life. And if I want my life to be a certain way, I'm going to have to do hard things. And I remember writing in my journal and saying to myself, right, you've got to make this work. And what I did was I made a list of all the things that I was doing in Thailand that I knew weren't making me happy. And I was super honest about it all. You know, it was hard to admit some of the things I was doing that I didn't like, you know, even kind of just certain people that I was hanging out with, mainly because I didn't want to be lonely in Thailand. <laughs> um, but I was thinking, am I really getting much from these interactions? Yeah. You know, are they, are they really, you know, helping with my mm. happiness here? And so I got super honest about the things that I really didn't like. And then I wrote on the next page, what things could I try and what do I need to find here in order to make me happy? And it was such simple things. Like I, like I was saying, in London, I love getting my hair done and my nails. Yeah. It is the, I just love it. Yeah. But I hadn't found a place I love to do it there. And I realised that those two things bring me so much joy. I often do them on a Saturday and I love to get up and work out and then go and get my hair and nails done. And for me, that is the most yeah. banging Saturday there is. <laughs> And um, it's so and good that like, you know that though, right? You've defined yeah. that. And that's that's sometimes exactly. the hardest point to get to for people is defining really what brings them joy. So, do you know what? Massively. And we'd think that that should be the easiest thing in the world, mm. right? But sometimes it's not. And and this is why I say to all of my clients and, and all of my friends and everyone that journaling is such a huge part of personal growth because that is where you define things. You define what's going on in your mind, the things that you want and the things that you don't like. And that's so important because once you get clear on that, can you really move forward in a positive way? And so I made it my mission every Saturday, right, go and go and try a new hair salon. Like every time you need your nails doing, go and try a new place. And I started narrowing it down like that place got a five out of 10, that place got a 10 out of 10. <laughs> and then I found my places, you know, Great. and um, and the, one of the great things I, I, I realized I got really unhealthy. And this is where the beginning of my business started, is that I knew that being and feeling unhealthy was having a huge impact on how happy I was because that just wasn't something I engaged in in London. Mm. And um, so I went out and I bought an oven because in Thailand, the kitchens, they don't have built in ovens. So you have to go and buy your own. And I, just something I hadn't done. And I bought an oven and I started baking and I hadn't baked since I'd been back in London. And it just gave me such a strong sense of home. And that was something that started bringing me that home comfort again. And so I was just, and I could, because I decided, right, I'm getting super healthy. I started baking without sugar and found sugar alternatives and without gluten and wheat. And I was using, you know, coconut oil and, and really natural food sources and especially local food sources so then I started mm. learning about different ingredients and I one day I was in a yoga studio and 
um, I don't know what came over me, but I just said to them, oh, I've started selling banana bread, which I hadn't actually started <laughs> selling it. I don't even know what came over me. But I just said, you know, the guys like to try it because they didn't have any snacks there. It was really, really just, uh, go on, Julia, why not? And I think yeah. I'd, I'd up-leveled that thinking. And, and, you know, it was like, well, why not take this risk? I know I can handle it. Yeah, and I didn't mind if it was a no. Then there was a business born overnight and it was it started with baking different flavours of banana bread. And that's how the Banana Warrior wow. started. That's incredible. Yeah. That's in, And that's your Instagram <laughs> yeah. handle, by the way, if anyone wants to follow yeah. you, the Banana Warrior. So that's incredible. So were there moments when you were sort of in the kitchen and you finally thought, right, I get the oven, which seems funny to us over in the Western world. You know, yeah. you're just like, oh, every house has an oven. So that doesn't feel like something yeah. special or a luxury, but you really identified that, right, actually, I need to get that part of uh, part of my life changed quickly. And did you give anyone else that kind of helped you along the way with baking bread or did this motivation come from an inner need to prove to yourself that I can stay and, and that drive to get up every day and sample different breads? And were you sort of really doing this on your own or did you have some help or anyone motivating you or is that inner drive? How, you know, how yeah. far does that go? That's a, it's a huge drive that you must have to to get up every day and do that yeah yeah absolutely do you know I I don't know where that stems from exactly I remember as a child my parents having to work very hard and you know to make things work my mum would work um days and my dad would work nights and I remember in order to save money on petrol my dad would cycle to work even in the bitter winter and I remember him coming home one day with icicles on his eyelashes <laughs> and me thinking wow you know that's hard work and they yeah. and I so I saw that growing up and so I was never kind of shy of of hard work but I think I was so excited by the prospect that people wanted to actually buy something that I had created from mm. you know and it went so much further than the actual banana bread like that was obviously a huge part yeah. of it but I started wrapping it in you know sustainable paper and tying it with string and then I'd put fresh flowers in the the wrapping and I was hand writing the labels for it and wow and it was this entire creation you know it yeah. was really like a piece of art that I and so the fact that people wanted to spend money on that did something to my soul it really I, made me almost it just enlivened me sparked everything in my being and so the drive was a natural part of that you know yeah. it was deep passion and deep excitement and there was just such a determination that I was going to do everything that I possibly could to make that work and I and you know I think that a lot of us can have that in the beginning and this is what I say to my clients as well you know, just make sure things are in place because, you know, as you said, the it can die the drive mm. if you're not making money or if, you know, there's kind of planning that's not kind of in place in the beginning because mm. we, you know, we actually, what, what happens is a lot of people are passionate about their business ideas in the beginning and a lot of people, I think to even start a business, you have to really want it to work and believe in it. Yeah. But the thing that makes some businesses work over ones that don't is consistency and keeping it going through the hard times when it doesn't feel as good, when you hit roadblocks, when the passion isn't as strong as it is in the beginning. Consistency is what will make your business successful and run for longer than those that don't. And, you know, mm. so for me, it was really sticking to that goal and that dream and just that just determination. I, I wanted it to work so much and I, I just I just knew that it was going to bring big things for me and it was the belief in that that mm. kept the consistency going. So at this stage were you still a primary school teacher as well and were you yes. juggling, yeah, juggling both? Yeah and that was mad. I yeah. Mean, so I actually was a primary school teacher for another six months so for the first right. six months of the business and it was absolutely exhausting. I mean I just wasn't sleeping much. I would so I started supplying to restaurants and cafes quite quickly and I didn't think about scaling. If anybody wanted to sell it, I just said yes. I was so happy about it. Yeah. And the name grew really quickly. I'd found a, a gap in the market. I had no idea that there was this gap, but there obviously was because I was only really doing it for myself because I couldn't find it anywhere. And mm. so and there were obviously other people that wanted that too. But yeah, I mean I would bake until one or two in the morning and then I would wake wow. up at five 
and wrap all of the banana bread and then I would go and teach and then I would come back on my break and take banana breads out of the oven and then run back again. Luckily, I lived so close to the school. It got to the end of that six months and I remember calling my mum and saying to her, I just don't know how much longer I can do this for. I mean, I am on my last yeah. legs. And um, there was one night when um, the power went out in my apartment and it was one in the morning and I hadn't finished the baking and I thought I've got to be up at five. And I just had this thought of, well, what if I didn't have to go to work tomorrow? And I think there was just that thought of, could I do this? Could I actually mm. do this full time? So I was making quite a good profit quite quickly. And then I sat down that night while I waited for the power to come on and I got no sleep that night. And I wrote down, OK, how much would I need to make in order to leave my full time job? How many banana breads would I have to sell per month? And I just thought, yeah. I'm going to try. I'm just going to do it. And I, the next day I just gave him my notice and I did it without thinking about it too much. Mm. Um, but I did think, you know what? I can go back to teaching if I want to anytime. There's yeah. always teaching jobs. So I thought, give it six months of running my own business and let's see. That's incredible, isn't it? I think you kind of handed your notice in, but didn't give it a second thought. But in the same breath, you had been running a business parallel yeah. to to teaching as well I mean that's a that's a huge amount to take on did you make sacrifices during that time were you oh yeah yeah what kind of things did you feel you had to kind of give up to to pursue your passion do you know what I love that you asked that because I think it's so easy to kind of romanticize a business especially when it's become successful right Mm. and and you know uh, I I know that it looks on the outside like it's this kind of wonderful, glamorous, wonderful thing, which it is, but it hasn't come without sacrifice, definitely. And I think that's a really important thing to touch on But for anybody that is about to start their own business or, or at the beginning or even in the middle is just, yeah, that you cannot have the same life as mm. you had before your business. You've got a completely different set of priorities. And there's just this, a certain type of personality and, you know, habits that have to take place in order for you to be successful. You know, you have to adopt those. And I think the biggest sacrifice for me was, yeah, I mean, I just didn't have any social life whatsoever, but it really was at the back of my mind. You know, for Mm. me, I just didn't care about that anymore, you know? And I, but in doing that, I did lose a lot of friends. However, there were friends that really stuck there and understood, mm. hang on, she's building something here and she's working as a in a full-time job. Of course she doesn't have time to do this. It's mm. not me being flaky. It's me saying, sorry guys, but actually my in my hundred percent of my focus is now going in this area. Mm. I hope I'll be back, but this is really important to me. And you actually in business can only have those kinds of people that understand around you because actually you know you have to think about what's more important to me is this relationship more important to me or is building my business more important to me and I had to get quite good at at letting people go and and letting that side of my life go as well Mm. but when you love it so much it doesn't feel so much of a sacrifice because you're seeking something else quite quickly did you learn things about yourself that you hadn't realized at this point when you're you know at this stage in your life you're really down in the nitty-gritty of building a business still sort of teetering on the edge of your full-time job working out whether or not this passion is going to be you know your next business your next big career move and you must have gone through a huge amount of self-development within that short space of time. So did, was there anything that kind of shocked you? You thought, wow, I did not know that about myself. Or were there any weaknesses that came up that really shone brightly and you were like, I've got to get that under control? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I surprised myself how I would just show up even if I really didn't want to, you know, and before I used to do a lot of farmers markets and yeah, weekend markets to to get the brand out there and to get people trying my food. And I would go to these markets alone and it was such an incredible amount of work. I mean, I did get help quite quickly. It was one of the nannies that would drop their kids, her the kids she looked after at school and then she would come and bake for me and then she would go back at home time and pick her kids up from school and you know take them home so I yeah so I had baking help um quite quickly and so she would help me bake the 
the bread sometimes and then I but I'd go to the markets alone and I'd set up alone and I'd carry everything there and it was so I remember just but it was so heavy like 30 banana breads in your bag is really heavy you know and, and it was just setting up and then and often wanting to cry the entire morning because it was so stressful and you're so nervous and and it's such a lot of work yeah but still being able to be like hi and then like try my products and be so excited about them there's something that just takes over and I liked that I liked learning that about myself that you know I could just still show up for the brand it was Mm. there wasn't a question of me cancelling or not showing up or you know and just knowing that there's a type of your personality that will come out if you're super passionate about something you know and I'll actually when I have been in other jobs before, I haven't shown the same level of professionalism yeah. and I haven't shown the deep dedication or the drive that I show now. I, you know, but now it's completely different. And I think before I just didn't care as much as I do now. Mm, and that really just shines out, doesn't it? When you, when you are really genuinely yeah. passionate and I guess it gets you through the dark days as well. Yeah. Definitely. And there are dark days, you know, like we were saying before that, you know, the first month that you work for yourself, the, that lack of a monthly paycheck is really shocking. I mean, mm. it really is like, whoa, I mean, what am I like? What's happened? You know, when you're in a, a nine to five or, you know, a full time job that that, you know, you know what date you're getting paid in, you on you rely on that money, you you wait for it, you know. Mm. But when you're working for yourself, it's this this consistent grind and money comes in at lots of different times in the month and you have to get very savvy with kind of managing that and making everything work. And that took me a good six months yeah. after I started working for myself to really get the hang of that because that was hard. And how quickly did you progress from baking banana breads on stalls to developing into the restaurant we can see today? Well, do you know, it was about three years in. What was amazing is that lockdown happened. We grew really quickly and we were having huge amounts of online orders. I think when we when I started the website about a year mm. in was when it really went off and, you know, we were having 30 to 40, sometimes 50 orders a day with different people all over Bangkok and Thailand. And I had a a team of kind of five bakers then and two assistants. And, you know, we were really, I felt, you know, I really felt the growth. It was really happening and it was exciting. We didn't know, none of us knew which way that was going to go. You know, we were just growing, but, but there wasn't actually, where are we growing to? Like what's happening, you know? Yeah. Um, I thought where I wanted to go with it was that I wanted to go more global. So I was thinking of moving somewhere in Southeast Asia and then setting it up there and then franchising. Um, I had heard that setting up a restaurant, there wasn't much financial return on it and that it was really hard right. work. So I was thinking a no to that. But what happened was obviously COVID hit hmm. and we our, our business boomed because everybody wanted comfort food at home and we pivoted and started putting challenges in our desserts so people would have to fulfill the challenges and then post them on um that's social brilliant. media and we had competitions for the banana oh, that's warrior so fun. yeah and so we just made it a game <laughs> yeah and we knew people knew stuff, but so we just and we did yeah, great you know, we put like yeah, we just were like what can we do um and we did like cooking um lives and you know we were all there like you know and then I started doing live podcasts and the only reason I started doing it is because we were just thinking, what can we do during lockdown? Loads yeah. of extra time in our hand, no markets, you know, all the restaurants were closed. So these podcasts that were called Sunset Chats just seemed to take off. And I, again, I had no idea that that's what was going to yeah. happen. I was just doing them because I thought, what else can we do? And it opened a whole new market for us because we were talking about um you know, female empowerment, very taboo subjects that weren't being spoken about in Thailand, you know, like masturbation, periods, sex, stuff that Thailand doesn't really like to talk about in right. any kind of public setting. Yeah. But it was time, obviously, you yeah. know, people were enjoying hearing about this, and it's empowering, right. And so what happened was somebody from this kind of big 
high end mall saw one of the podcasts because I was mainly reaching out to celebrities just because they were helping yeah. our brand get a huge reach. So, so yeah, the director of this big mall reached out to us and just said, "I've got a um, I've got a cafe space if you want to take it over." And it was wow. bizarre because when I got the phone call, it was um, you know when it's just an instant yes, yeah, where there's no. There was just no question. I knew it. I just thought, yeah. I almost said yes before seeing the space. But then I <laughs> went to see the space. And the crazy thing was is that we'd just come out of lockdown, probably yeah. about four or five months out. Not a good time. To, and it was very rocky. Um, but because of that, they gave us such a good financial deal that it was it would have been absolutely insane not to do it. And the mall is was so close to home, one of the best malls in the city and it and the space was beautiful so light and I just thought yeah let's do it and so but they said to us you've got to be open in uh, six weeks which was mad again wow you know that's a lot yeah. of work in six weeks to get that off the ground I'd never opened a restaurant before so to learn mm. what to do to be open in six weeks and to develop a savory food menu right. as well. And also, I had an investment to put towards it, but it wasn't a high investment. Mm. And because they gave us such a good financial deal, we didn't need it, but it meant that we had to do everything ourselves. So we didn't, I didn't get a designer in. Um, I didn't get a chef in. I mean, I, I hired people and I taught them how to cook the food, but you know, I developed this menu. We did it with everything That's because incredible. I had this team of five. Yeah, we just made it work. And um, that's absolutely yeah, six, six incredible. Weeks later, open. Yeah, that's absolutely <laughs> fantastic. I mean, you must have learned a huge amount. Not only are you developing and designing the menus, but you're also now managing I don't, quite a lot of staff. And yeah, a lot yeah. of pressure comes with that. You know, it, be, it goes beyond the job of doing the job. And as somebody who's very entrepreneurial, you know, you're very used to to working at a high level and getting the job done and when you're managing a yeah. team it becomes more than the job it's it's a community you're building you're dealing with personalities and you're dealing with all those yeah. other people's lives at the same time did was there a point where it all became too much for you where you're just thinking I've got to change up what I'm doing or you know this is growing far beyond I can even imagine and I need some extra support or did it start to challenge you in sort of any sort of mental physical spiritual ways in those kind of very fast growth moments I just think it motivated me honestly I think I just got really excited every time that I would feel us growing yeah um, there were times if I'd have staff members leave that used to really upset me and used to make me panic because th because everybody had their role and if they would leave what you were just saying it's such a community that mm. you build it and because I'm in I was in Thailand full time then and lockdown had just been so I hadn't been able to get back to England for two years wow that they were genuinely like my family you know and and I felt like I needed them not just for business but I genuinely felt like I needed them you know for my kind of companions almost and that's and especially you know when you kind of get a personal assistant they are with you so much mm. of the time you speak to them every day they've got your back so much if you get a good one and they, they should have your back I, I remember one personal assistant I got so close to and she did so much for helping open the restaurant and when she left I just really felt it it really just felt because you know it's kind of hard to keep a friendship after that and, and yeah. to be realistic it's not a friendship it is yeah. still a professional relationship and I think that taught me as all difficult things in, in business and life teach you something that taught me to keep a professional boundary and not let it merge into friendship because it is just too painful luckily I managed to replace her professionally quite quickly and I'm close to my assistant now yeah but there is a very professional boundary there and it's something that I actually have to work quite hard on myself to not cross over that boundary because mm. I don't think it's good for 
for anybody and you know people move on that is the nature of work as well right so mm. then you have to let people move on and so yeah that was good learning for me and now one of the biggest lessons is don't let your emotions get in the way of business what's best for business is people that want to be there yeah you know not who you want to be there because it fits your social life where it fits you know what you need for yourself personally like what's best for business take your emotions out of it and that helps and that that's an incredible sort of growth spurt really to get to that point and you know you've built this based on a passion so to move it into a business where you've got that boundary and a definition I guess of emotion versus business it's a tricky one and I think even more so for women who who tend to be more emotionally led in decision making. Yeah. It's a it's a very hard skill to hone, I would say. Yeah. And it's hard yeah. to keep it in check as well because naturally, you know, you're a nurturer, you're you're and you're working in a food environment, which is something that's very homely and nurturing to people and yeah. you're building this community. So making those business decisions amongst you know anything else I'd imagine can be quite tricky at times oh my gosh yeah and you really said it there I mean that's exactly how it is it's hard right especially well I think definitely as as a woman and for me personally I'm super sensitive and I have throughout my life kind of tried to change that a bit but then I realized that that's one of the things that makes me so creative and and helps me kind of um, connect to customers and clients and things like that I can feel things quite deeply and there's the flip side of that that things can be quite painful you know and and I I agree with you it's like a tightrope kind of you know trying to get that kind of balancing act Mm. of you know being an emotional human and actually needing that for a lot of aspects of your business but also being able to control that a bit and pull that back Mm. when there's times where I think I guess it's just knowing when your emotions are serving you and when they're not serving you you know and then to make a decision how much you're going to let your emotions take over Mm. and I do think you can practice getting quite good at that but it is definite practice and is that practice does that happen on a sort of a daily occurrence or a sort of hourly do you is it about bringing the attention I guess an awareness back to yourself just to take stock about yeah. what you're thinking um do you have any like little practices or any tools in your back pocket that help you yeah I do I do <laughs> I for me meditation is I would probably be dead without meditation. <laughs> I That is the quote of <laughs> the <know>. century. <laughs> <laughs> I don't sound dramatic, but I like it. I like the um, drama of that because it really hopefully resonates to the listeners that meditation, if they haven't already guessed, is very important. Yes. <laughs> to put it lightly, yes. I mean, I with meditation, I have managed to make my emotions quite steady I think before that it was a little bit up and down you know and there wasn't much control over my emotions and there's something about meditation that genuinely just feels like magic but it is like a muscle that you have to flex what you know that I always recommend it to my clients because I think that business owners should have this practice one because you need mental clarity when you're making business decisions and the way that you're, you want you want to be very clear on the way that you want to show up and make sure you're showing up like that as a business owner you know you mm. are your brand so you need to make sure you are showing up the way that you want your brand to show up. And it brings an insane amount of clarity and just this kind of much calmer, more grounded approach to life. Mm. And that in turn seems to balance your emotions and your reactions. Um, So I meditate every day, sometimes twice a day, just 20 minutes in the morning and sometimes 20 minutes in the evening, which actually isn't much out of your day at all, you know, but it it changed my life completely. And how do you meditate? How do you, how does it work for you? Because I think there's still so many people who are hearing about meditation, but aren't necessarily engaged in where to start and it's it can sound overwhelming and people say it has all these you know does all these great things for you but actually how do I meditate really I didn't know either and I used to I've heard a lot of people say oh I can't meditate Mm. and I said no everybody can but it's like when you go to the gym right you're not going to have a six-pack straight away for example Mm. I mean 
you know, I'll probably never yes. have a six pack, but I mean, no, you know, I mean, just, <laughs> some of us might not ever have one, but yeah. Walking into the gym, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you know what I mean? I mean, <laughs> it takes consistent work and consistent practice at the gym to feel like you're making changes that you want to make. It's the same with meditation. It's your mind is genuinely like a muscle that you need to continuously flex in order to do it. And I know a lot of people that will kind of meditate once and then they will, you know, not feel the benefits of it and stop. But but it remember that kind of gym analogy that, you know, really I'd say you need to be meditating for a month or two months to start feeling the benefits and you've just got to trust and kind of believe that and it and really now if I don't meditate for two or three days I really feel Mm. it it's really strong the difference so I trained in transcendental meditation Mm. and that's the one that works the best for me so basically you just close your eyes and I set a 20 minute timer on insight timer so it's quite nice if you're new to meditation to watch the time go down because otherwise it just feels a bit overwhelming like 20 minutes sitting there doing Mm. nothing but um and what you do with transcendental meditation is you just let your mind go on a little journey and you're not in control of that journey. So you might see colors, you might see things happening. And anytime you kind of feel your mind wandering off to specific thoughts, you just bring it back and it it feels like this kind of just flow of like, where am I kind of going today? You know, so for me, I feel like my mind is dancing sometimes and just and just moving with colors and, and lights and it's quite beautiful. You really, you can feel quite high after you finish. That's incredible. I've heard so much about transcendental meditation. Yeah. Um, yeah. I know for me personally, I do a lot. I mean, I do my yoga practice in the morning, which I try and incorporate meditation into that yeah. and as much as possible. And even people just going out for a walk, being able to yeah. be at one, just with your thoughts and your, and your breath work, I think is a really great place to start, isn't it? It's just to get your mind in tune and to slow slow yourself down a bit absolutely I think morning routines everything isn't it Mm. I mean I don't know about you as a business owner but like you're right like for me it's like get outside if you can meditate you know hydrate all of those things and if you can get up early I would say the earlier the better it just puts you on a completely different wavelength to you know, if you lie in, I mean, use your weekends to lie in, but yeah. get up early, get yourself ready, show up. And I can promise you, your day will be 10 times better. Do you have a morning routine that you feel you've really honed and works for you? Yeah, I do. So I get up around half five, six. That doesn't get easier though. Like, especially mm. in England, it's like really hard <laughs> it's getting up in the dark. Black. And it's freezing now this morning. Was I know. Freezing. I had a client at 6 a.m. online this morning, so I have to get up at 5 on a Tuesday wow. to see this client. And it's and that's hard, right? To, to, to show up at 6 and be chatting business is just like that's a skill in itself. incredible. Like. How do you how do you do that? That is oh, that it's not easy. I'm not going to lie. Like that was hard this morning, and you know, I'm kind of sitting before she comes on, thinking, okay, come on, Julia, it's a self talk, you know get yourself together but I yeah so I get up half five six uh, straight away I journal and that's the biggest thing so I just 20 minutes probably just writing down anything that's come up really I don't turn on my phone until I finish my morning routine I think that's really important that's interesting and I just said turn on your phone do you do you turn it off yeah I put it on flight mode overnight yeah yeah that's good yeah yeah and then I don't turn it off flight mode until until I finish because I need that time to myself that's often the only time I'll get to myself without people coming at me with like questions or anything all day so I'll journal and then I meditate and then I work out and that can be like I love to run but if it's still dark I you know will wait (laughs) um Pilates yoga weights um anything but move your body like that's important in whatever way feels good for you and then I'll try and get outside for just a five ten minute walk but I think just because when you work for yourself you can spend a lot of time inside and Mm. it can be very insular and that's not good I think for your brain that's it and then I get when I'm getting ready so I always plan my outfit the night before because that's the thing that takes the longest and I but when I'm getting ready I usually repeat some positive affirmations to myself you know that I am 
and then you got you fill in the blanks and that can be different every day but whatever you feel like you're not feeling so much of you just tell yourself over and over again while you're getting ready yeah I love I love the power of affirmations I think they I think a lot of people can shy away from it because it feels like you're being too kind to yourself almost and people struggle with that they struggle to give that self-love I know that's so true what's your morning routine it's not dissimilar really Uh, for me my my yoga is my non-negotiable um I generally don't look at my phone in the mornings but my yoga and my breathing is is sort of that quiet time and I read in the morning as well I have a book the Mm. called the untethered soul I love yeah it's such a good book uh, called by Michael Singer and that's my kind of go-to and I have a small dog um, who is my little fur baby? So my job every morning is to walk her. Whatever happens. Oh it's, yeah, perfect. It's, it's the kind of the non-negotiables, which you know, I'm, my husband and I were laughing the other morning just how long our morning routine is. We're like, we need to get up earlier and earlier. You know, I, I know. get up around six-ish. It's so hard in the su- so the winter and the summer. I change my hours a bit. I allow mm, myself. Yeah. I la- I mean, I can't walk the dog really. At the very earliest, it would be half seven, and it's closer to sort of quarter to eight really, because the sun's not up. And I, quite frankly, yeah. You know, I try and <laughs> I try and operate a bit more around the seasons, and I'm not really one to kind of be out there like a trooper dark kind of dragging my dog of which I have a French bulldog and I had to wake her up this morning so she, she oh, really? so I just That's go so cute. I know and I go by the beat of her drum a lot and then uh, because I'm quite yeah, a morning nice. person I I tend to stress in the morning if I've not done all my morning bits before work and actually yeah sometimes I swap it around and I actually try and walk the dog later get to you know start work actually much earlier and switch the whole routine around when I know it's going to be dark at three o'clock I know yeah. that my I've got post 3 p.m jobs that you know that I don't mind doing sitting in the office till late in the business so it all I try and shift around my life a bit according to the seasons because I think as as you know living in Thailand versus living here oh, to get up it's every so much day it's, to get up in Thailand yeah yeah seriously it's nicer it's, the weather's better oh, it's very hard when the weather yeah. creeps in it, it we talk about it a bit on the podcast um on previous episodes about the seasons and they do really affect how we operate yeah and it's um yeah and I'm sure you've noticed that coming from two very different climates. Definitely. I mean, I, when I'm in Thailand, I meditate sitting on my balcony and the sun's coming up and it's warm and, you know, it's just lovely, completely different. I mean, this morning I was utterly frozen. I, I mean, <laughs> I was having to talk myself out of like feeling like I was too cold, let alone doing my positive <laughs> affirmations. You know, like, what's happening with this meeting? I mean, so yeah, it's completely different. I was going to say, I read The Untethered Soul hmm. last year. Does that help you with levelling out your emotions? Because that, that idea of us watching what's happening in our life rather than being directly involved in it is a really interesting Mm. concept yeah you touched on something really important and there's a bit in the book about how you need to allow the energy to pass through you yeah and be an observer and that's something that yeah it's really stuck with me I'm very much a bit like you you know led by passion and led by instincts and guts and I tend to react quickly on those instincts rather than sitting with it and letting it pass through and then making a decision or acting. And I think yes. it's it, it's interesting for all of us. I, I think irrelevant of your personality type, a lot of us need to sit with the energy more and just wait before we, quite simply, before we send an email that we don't need, necessarily need to send. Absolutely, yeah. Because energy is, it's. Just, I mean, emotions are energy in motion. Mm. And it, it was always meant to just pass through. But we've got so many kind of triggers and past traumas and, and things inside us that the emotions kind of attach onto and it makes them much bigger things. But you're absolutely right. Just, just Mm. waiting for it because it will pass if you let it pass because it's meant to, it's meant Mm. to run through. Oh, absolutely. The Untethered Soul is, is such a wonderful book. It really takes you all the way through the human journey to death. And yeah, I pick it. I don't read it sort of front to back anymore. It's a book that I pick up and just open it at a page. I close my eyes. I just, open it at the page that it falls on and I take out the paragraph and it's so funny sometimes I'm like oh I've read this bit (laughs) and then I think oh I need this bit I know I I know I opened it a few days ago (laughs) and I remember there's a reason why you've reopened it and that's 
that's what you need to sit quietly and you're not thinking you know you're you know you're too in your mind again you're too rushing you're going through the process of this is my morning routine this is what I do done done yeah. done tick 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 right off let's get yes. let's get going so I I have to catch myself because sometimes I <laughs> try and rush ahead again and think oh boring read this bit <laughs> <laughs> and then you're like do you know what's the reason you said I, sometimes you open it and that's the page you were meant to open it on that's such a I love that spiritual mm. kind of attachment to reading mm. yeah I find it's I find for me it, I love I love to read a book um, and yeah. try and pick up a book as much as I can. And d- don't get me wrong, they are all based around the same subject topic mostly. <laughs> yeah, all around me too. mutuality. Yeah. <laughs> I've me tried too. to read other books. I, Do you have a favourite book? Is there anything that really resonated with you on your journey? It's so generic, but the book that always pops up because this is the well, this was the start of me being spiritual. Is the secret, and I know that's so kind not of not at all. Kind of, it's a great book it's so mainstream yeah great book and and it just genuinely started making my mindset a much more positive place to Mm. be and I truly do believe in manifestation and putting yourself on a positive wavelength and all of that I truly believe that that brings more of what you want you know like attracts like and negativity brings more negativity and there is actually a culture that is part of my team Now, you know, one of our key words when we're talking about, you know, the kind of ethos that we want to create at the Banana Warrior is positivity. And I, they know, my staff know, I don't want to hear moaning. And it's actually, we've said that it's just completely banned. I don't want to hear it. Mm. What I want is for my staff and my team to come to me with issues if there are them. And then we talk about finding the solution. Mm. But, and I always say to them, there's, we can find solutions to anything. But if you're moaning, you're not trying to find a solution. It's just making it worse, Mm. you know, and I don't mind problems and I don't mind. I like solutions, but I don't like creating drama and, you know, unnecessary negativity surrounding problems. That's really smart. I think that's a very strategic way to approach problems. And we often sit in that place of moaning. It's like we're especially in the UK, you know, the Western (laughs) world, we just love to sit and moan. And my gosh, yeah. I mean, I think that makes us all feel better when we're moaning. But my goodness, to be surrounded by that, you know, on a daily basis, especially in your place of work, is quite a lot. It infects the rest of the culture. uh, Yes, it does. You know, all I know is that when I lived in England, I used to be one of those moaners. And now that I and I could be very negative. And now that I live in Thailand, I don't do that anymore. I just refuse to do it. And after reading The Secret and loads of other Mm. books on manifestation and positive thinking, I don't moan anymore. And I stop myself if I if I kind of start and my life, honestly, is a hundred times better. Mm, I love that. Everything in my life is a hundred times better. And you know, that is concrete evidence for me that moaning doesn't work. Moaning doesn't make anything better. It makes it worse and it gives you more of what you're moaning about, you know? And so I, like, why would you want that? You know, what? Mm. why would you want more of what you're moaning about? And yeah. don't make it something that you do in your life. You know, as you said, it's so, it's so common now. And actually I, w- I will say in, in, you know, amongst often amongst the expat community I don't hear it as much and I don't know if it's because people have chosen different paths for their life and they Mm. feel more satisfied I'm not sure but you know one thing I was kind of saying before is that if you really do feel like you want to moan about your life or things that are going on and, and things genuinely do feel really really hard you know of course, that is that is valid. But think about ways that you can change what's going on for you. Think about ways that you can change what isn't working and what is making you want to moan. Because there are always changes that can that can happen. You don't need to live in this place of moaning and negativity. Mm. You can you can change that. Anybody can. Exactly. It's the will to want to change. I have a I have yeah. an older brother who I has don't think has any will to change. In fact, he really loves just moaning <laughs> on a daily basis. <laughs> It's become his DNA. Really? And even actually, you know, we pull yeah. back as a family and think, life isn't too bad for him, is it? No, we'll just let, let him continue to moan and he can stay in his yes. corner over there, you know. But 
again, it it goes back to the willingness to want to change and often shining a light on that and knowing where to to turn to to, for extra support. You know, we're talking about just moaning about the weather or doing typical moans about hate my job, but no, but providing no real understanding as to why you hate your job you know and that's the problem with moaning it becomes it becomes so fluid in our conversation that we just say it without really thinking and I think that's what we're really trying to say here isn't it it's 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 those types of moans you know whilst people go through problems and need to seek you know external support and help from professionals I think there's a lot of us just day to day are just in that state of slightly disgruntled with life but not really sure why or how and it becomes second nature and that's yeah, that's the part absolutely. we need to get rid of to try and find a bit more fulfillment and appreciation yeah. of where we are that appreciation of where we are is what we miss when we are moaning mm. we what happens is you just stop seeing all of your blessings and we all have blessings even if your blessing is only to be alive at the moment you know not everybody has that and not everybody else lived as as to see what you're seeing now you know and and that unfortunately we take ourselves away from that and this life that we're all living this is getting super deep here but this life that we're living we're not always going to live it like we're not we know we're not going to be alive forever what's the point in having a much more negative view of life why not have a life that is full of abundance and positive beautiful thoughts and counting your blessings and appreciating what you have and the people in your life you know life is better when you do that and life doesn't last forever so maybe just just choose to do that mm. it's, it's that easy just choose <laughs> yeah. just choose to do that and if you're listening to this yeah. this is your calling to choose to do that yeah. and it's a sign it's a sign it's the sign and this is all about giving back <laughs> <laughs> really on this podcast we have one final um question that we love to ask everybody and that is what does becoming more human mean to you straight away i just think of authenticity really being true to who you are and not being afraid to show up as who you really are you know what do you really believe in what are the things that are really important to you you know what subjects do you feel like you want to stick up for um and do it because when you do that you not only attract a tribe of people who are very authentic to you as well who Mm. make you feel good and who support your dreams and your life and, and all of that but you start to align with the things that are meant for you, I believe, and you start to attract more of what is genuinely meant for you in your life. And it's okay if when you start getting more in touch with what is really real and true to you, if it's not the same as what is real and true to the people around you, it's okay. Mm. And it's okay to change. And we are humans that are consistently evolving. And just really sitting in the fact that just allow that flow and just allow yourself to be truly authentic you'll feel so much better if you are and your life will feel much more aligned i'm francesca Donellan, and you've been listening to becoming more human the podcast you can follow becoming more human on instagram subscribe rate and review the podcast on your podcast apps such as spotify apple amazon and google And don't forget to check out our website for exclusive audio content on becomingmorehuman.co.uk. Join me next week for another inspiring conversation. Thank you for listening.